Welcome to Novelist Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight is Michael Bluin. He has won Best Novel in Canada, not once, but twice, 2009 and 2021. He's been shortlisted for the Amazon First Novel Award, the BP Nickel Award, the CBC Literary Award, and is a winner of the Diana Brebner Award and the 2012 Lampman Award. His most uh, recent books are the novel Skin House and the anthology titled The Group of Seven. Subtitled Contemporary Stories Reimagining Historical Canadian Paintings. Forthcoming are the novel I Am Billy the Kid and a collection of poetry titled Southbound. Michael Blue, and welcome to the program. Well, thanks very much, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. And you know, you're in a perfect situation because where are you right now? Are you, are you in Toronto, Canada or Winnipeg? Where, where's your locale? I'm just south of uh, the nation's capital, Ottawa, uh, by about a half hour and about uh, 20 minutes away from the American border in New York. So perfect situation because um, I believe you said it's about 11 degrees below zero, which, uh, you know, if you're a writer, you want to you want the, the forces of nature to kind of cocoon you, force you indoors into a room where you sit with your computer and you write. Or do you? Are, are you using a computer? Um, do the nat do, and do the natural elements kind of lend itself to a person like yourself who's a writer? I um, I do use a computer exclusively. I have tried other methods, uh, and I just don't seem to be able to make it work with pencil and paper or pen and paper. I need the keyboard, and I need that interaction between the screen and, and my eyeballs. Uh, as far as nature goes, I love walking outside. I like to get a, a good... 10 to 20 kilometers in a day. But uh, as you said, freezing rain here, it's not particularly conducive to, to walking today. But uh, yeah, I, and I do set up my office so that it's a very friendly place to be. Uh, I've got, I surround myself with uh, things that are related to the work that I'm doing. And um, I, I find it's, uh, it's a very home-like environment in here. And uh, that, that's helpful to actually putting the butt in the seat and getting the words down. So you're a poet and you're a novelist, and um, you know you you have you seem to have a lot of interest in a lot of different styles that you want to dabble in. You're working, I think, we're working on an experimental novel as well. Um, what kind of writer are you? I mean, if you were to do, do you ever label yourself that you're this or that type of writer, or do you really come from the standpoint of I'm a writer and I've got a lot of different uh, genres or, or venues or styles that I like to to exercise. Is there any way that you can synthesize that into into a statement, or is that more limiting than you want to be? Um, no, I don't mind limits at all. I like to set limits and then try to uh, work through them. Um, it brings to mind, though, what you're saying, a quote uh, that I've always carried with me since I started writing in my teenage years, I suppose, which seems like a long time ago. And the quote is, you're not a writer when you say you are, son. You're a writer when someone else says you are. <laughs> and that's from, uh, I always forget where it's from, but it, I made a note to uh, remember today. And it's from a movie called Hearts of the West, with I think it's with Jeff Bridges. And it, it's a fairly old movie. And I believe it's based on a book, although I couldn't tell you who wrote it. Um, and that's always rung true to me. I don't, you know, that doesn't mean it has to ring true to anybody else, but it did to me as a young writer. And it took very many years before someone else actually called me a writer. And I guess if, if uh, who was someone, that person who was, do you remember uh, who it was or wh where it happened? Um, well, the first person would probably be the editor of the first magazine uh, that I got published in, in Canada. Um, and she wouldn't have used those words exactly, but I knew now that I was uh, someone who was getting published to me, that was the legitimate Okay, now I can call myself a writer because someone else has by virtue of the fact that they've published me. Yeah, got it. But if I were to say, you know, if someone were to ask me now, I think I would say that I'm a novelist because that's what I enjoy doing most. I'm, I'm obsessed with writing novels. 
And I don't really refer to myself as a poet, even though, uh, you know, by definition I am because I publish books of poetry and I've got one coming up uh, in the next year or so. But I find I, I, I read a lot of contemporary poetry, partly because uh, I work as an adjudicator for an arts council here in Canada. And, uh, and so I, I receive a lot of manuscripts and I see what's going on in, in the best contemporary Canadian poetry. And it's mostly, um, I'm sure this is true in America as well, it's mostly to do with doing amazing things with language. And I think I do that as a novelist, but I don't think I do that as a poet. Uh, I think I'm more of an old school poet. Uh, and um, so I'd hesitate to call myself a poet. I'm just, I'm a novelist who, uh, who dabbles and I hope that I don't get in anybody's way when I'm doing poetry. Does poetry um, strengthen or feed your fiction writing in any way? Is that part of why you do it? Or is it just that you like to dabble with it and it, it's, it's a fun pastime? I started writing, uh, when I first started way back, it was short stories, as I think it is for a lot of people. And I really, uh, that was just the early stages of my career. And I, I haven't done a short story now in probably 30 years or more. Um, and then I started writing novels. And like most novelists, uh, at least the first two or three attempts never went anywhere, thank God. Uh, they're, they, they used to be, I used to say they're in a drawer somewhere, but, uh, we had a house fire uh, a couple of years ago now. Uh, and, uh, so they're not even in a drawer anymore. They don't oh, exist. Wow. And, and, the, and the world's a better place for that, I think. Um, and then, and then I, I wouldn't call it writer's block. I would say by the time I hit my late twenties, early thirties, uh, life got in the way of writing. And I don't really mean in the way, it's just that other things happened, uh, such as marriage and children and, uh, beginning a teaching career and all of that. So so things kind of went on the back burner. And the way that I finally got back into writing about 10 years later was through poetry. I just kind of out of nowhere started writing down, jotting down notes and things that turned into poems. And uh, they finally got published and, and that led to writing novels. So, well, that's kind of how I think about it. Uh, and so when I write poetry now, I, I do think of myself as a novelist writing poetry. And when I write novels now, I just think of myself as a novelist. So I think that that kind of defines how I think of myself as a writer, I guess. So you've been at this for quite a while. So have you established the the vaunted writer's voice? Do you Do you have a writer's voice? And I ask that question because there's so many people who write for years, maybe their whole lives, and they feel like they never quite got to that voice, that inner voice. They... I think there is a tendency, and I know that it's within me, to to write a particular style to try to sound like somebody else, to try to channel somebody rather than necessarily tap my own inner voice. Do you feel that that you've got that voice now after your years of, of doing what you've been doing? I do. I think of it actually as my most prized possession. Um, and it took, well, in my case, I would say it took decades to get there. And, and I think it's formative in, in why I can now sit down at any time of the day or night and pick up where I left off in whatever uh, novel I'm working on and just go. It's because the voice is there. Um, and for many years it wasn't. Um, and that, that's no really good place to be as a writer because you can still write, of course, but, but it, as I remember it anyway, in my case, it was always a struggle. And I, I always, I fell into the trap of thinking, well, I will sit down and write when the magic happens. And that's, I think, by default, a, a way that young writers or, or beginning writers have to work. But uh, at this stage in my career, I don't have to wait anymore. I know that when I sit down, that's when uh, the process starts. It's not like I have to wait for it to knock on the door and come in. So for the people listening who are wondering, you know, would I appreciate Michael Bluen's writing or not? I haven't uh, ever come across one of his books. Uh, why don't you slap some adjectives on that writer's voice of yours? If you were to define it or characterize it, what are some of the adjectives you, you'd use to say this, this is what Michael Bluen's voice is? I, I love that. Like. I, uh, I've done many, many interviews. No one's ever asked me that question. So here we go. Edgy, innovative, daring, experimental, emotional, 
engaging. And I'll throw in one that, that I can only hope is true, but that's up to the reader. Devastating. Wow. I wasn't expecting uh, that, but I'll tell you, um, I think what you're talking about is what a lot of, that's a huge stumbling block for so many writers because as safe as writing is, and the fact that we can write and then just trash it and just start over, I think it, people still find it really hard to be daring, to, to take risk and to just be, um, God, I'm, I'm looking f for the word, but I, I think it was Brenda Ulan who wrote a book, If You Want to Write. Um, and she talked about being reckless. That was the word. She said, be mm -hmm. reckless when you write because you can't really destroy anything. You know, you can you can do really stupid things in life with drugs and crime and, and bad behavior, but you can do it on the written page and, and, and survive it. And you can go back to live another day. Um, yes. So but how did you, you get to that point? I mean, how did you uh, finish that thought, though? You said, yes, but go ahead. I, sorry to interject, but it just occurred to me that everything you said is absolutely true. But you have to keep in mind, particularly if you're uh, if you're starting out, that people when you're writing novels, people will assume that everything that you write is about you and that everything you write is true. My my, uh, my first published novel dealt with uh, two, uh, a young brother and a sister who are horribly uh, abused by their parents. Um, and for years afterwards, because that book uh, achieved a fair amount of notoriety, people would approach me and say, gosh, I'm so sorry. I had no idea that your childhood was so horrendous. And, and mine wasn't. I was very fortunate. Uh, and so you do have to keep in mind, well, you don't have to keep it in mind. It's probably better not to keep it in mind. But the fact remains that people will assume that uh, large elements of what you write in fiction are true and that they, they apply to you. Yeah, sorry, that, that, the, that, yeah, that was an ahead. interjection. Sorry, that was an interjection. No, no, that's fine. Um, uh, pl please uh, do. Um, the that's kind of the bane of, of, of writing. I mean, when somebody becomes a famous writer, that becomes kind of the bane of writing is that they try, and this is what happened to say Philip Roth and a lot of other writers, Phil, Philip Roth in particular, I think, um, or is a, is a really uh, good example of it where he would write things and he said, I'm writing characters, I'm writing stories and, and but people would apply it to him. It, it, it always became auto fiction. People like to turn it into autobiographical fiction and, you know, no doubt all these experiences we have in life, we, we, uh, you know, synthesize those, we caricature them and so on and so forth. Um, but people really, uh, readers, critics in particular tend to, tend to treat it that way that, uh, well, this is, this is really kind of autobiographical. Uh, and that's often a criticism of writing. Let me ask you for the people listening who are, um, you know, whether they're young or seasoned writers, they're still looking for that elusive voice. What would you say as the, uh, do you have any thoughts on the, the or ideas about the best way to, to actually find that inner voice? What, what would you say a writer has to do? It just put the pen on the paper or hit the keyboard and keep going because the voice is there and, and writing is the only thing that's going to bring it out. And if you're like me, you're probably going to have to write an awful lot before that voice becomes itself, as opposed to an echo of some writer that you admire, which which there will always be elements of that, and that's a good thing. But in order to come up with something that is truly original in terms of voice or true to yourself, it really is a matter of write, 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 and then keep writing more. I, I like the quote, do something new. And you, as a young writer, you can, you, you will inevitably start copying other people and that's a good step in, in a process. But when the process that you're trying to uh, culminate and the stage that you're trying to get to, I think anyway, is to do something new, even though everything's already been done before, we, we shouldn't have any illusions about that. You're trying to put a new spin on it. And, and that's a big part of voice. You're, you're doing, you're using tropes and character types and plot lines that have been done and done and done and done. But when you achieve uh, an authorial voice, you're doing it in a new way. Yeah. Now you said, and keep going. And I, I glommed onto that phrase because that sounds like uh, it kind of maybe strikes out how you write in terms of just producing the copy. Would you tell an aspiring writer, don't just sit there staring at the page and, and leak out 
one and two and three words at a time. Just get copy, keep your fingertips moving and get copy flowing. I mean, how do you write? Do you, do you tend to be a fast writer just in terms of, of, um, of getting actual words on the screen or are you kind of a quick blast of, of a phrase or a sentence and then you're sitting there for several moments uh, contemplating your next move? I, I don't set goals for myself other than the goal that I would encourage any, uh, any aspiring writer to, to follow is write every day. You have to write every day. There's no way around that, whether it's a word or whether it's 10 pages, that's your job. And, and you have to get used to that. Um, but I myself, I'll, I can, I write every day, obviously, and, and I'll probably be in the office writing or doing something that looks like writing uh, anywhere between, it's hard to think of it being less than an hour, and it, it's often five to six hours. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to do that. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it varies, I think, very much from one person to another. But I can be quite happy in five or six hours having produced a killer line. Um, and I can be even happier, I suppose, if I come up with 10 pages. And, and it could be either outcome. So when you're writing, when you're working on a, a novel, you say the characters are in control. Uh, what do you mean by that? Like how, told, how do, in, in, what, in what sense are they in control? The, this is the way I think about it. They're writing the book. They're living the lives that I'm just recording. And, and I have uh, a relationship to my characters that I, I imagine other authors must have it as well, although I, I don't hear people articulating it uh, that often. I'm just along for the ride. And my, my, my characters are telling me what's not only what's happening in the, in the instant that I'm writing the dialogue or the scene, I really am taking direction from them. And I think it's, it seems to be uh, true in a larger sense as well, in that they often seem to know uh, where the plot's going when I myself have no idea. I, um, I start any of my novels having no idea where they're going to go. Uh, my, uh, my novel, I Am Billy the Kid, that comes out in April, it started, uh, I was having a shower one morning, and that title popped into my head. There was nothing else there. I, I, I was not a huge follower of Billy the, fan, Billy, Billy the Kid or a fan of, of that genre in any way. That title just popped into my head, and as soon as it did, I thought, oh, that's a book, as opposed to, oh, that's a line of dialogue, or that's an interesting line. I wonder what I could do with that. I knew right away that it was a full 300 page, 400 page novel. And um, the, that novel, I would say, was written by the, the three main characters that uh, when I was a third of the way through that novel, I had no idea how it was going to end. Uh, and that's true of all of them. I like to get to if I know that if I get to about a third of the way through a manuscript and I haven't written the last page yet, I might be in trouble. And so far, it's always happened at that point, more or less. And when I say write the last page, I don't mean I have some kind of chart at that point that tells me what the plot is. I still don't know what's going to happen between the page I'm on and that last page. But it helps me, it helps to ground me to have that last page written. And I know then that I have, a, a, I wouldn't call it a goal, I have a, uh, a destination. And then it's just a matter of finding my way between where I am and what that last page represents. I'm very yeah, I know that feeling. That feeling. It's a wonderful feeling when you're writing um, and you realize, okay, that's my finish. And yeah, yeah, and then everything else kind of can take some some shape because, as you say, you've got a destination um, that you're aiming towards. Exactly. And it, there's a great sense of security in that because when you're dealing with 400 pages and you're only 50 pages in, there's this, you know, there's this vast expanse of territory that needs to be covered. And if you're a, a pantser like me, as opposed to someone who charts everything and, and has that security uh, of knowing what's going to happen and when, at what points and where the plot points are, um, when you're someone like me who, who is literally, I feel like I'm walking a tightrope at that point. But as soon as I have that last page, I, I know where the tightrope ends. I can see the pole at the other end of the circus tent. 
and uh, I know I can make my way to it. And I've heard writers say that, uh, you know, I do work with an outline, but my characters will will just decide, no, we're not going that direction, we're going to go mm -hmm. this direction. Um, you write to develop organically. I mean, you let your, your characters in control, you let them uh, set the direction really from the onset. So when you're talking about I am Billy the Kid, is that going to be set in um, in his time period or, or is this going to be set in modern day? The uh, conceit of I am Billy the Kid is that uh, uh, I, I should preface this with I, I hear writers and podcasts talking very definitively about facts and figures and dates and names and particularly writers of historical fiction. I'm not that type of person. So uh, I'll have to say here, the conceit of the novel is that when Billy the Kid was killed by Pat Garrett. Um, he didn't actually, he, he faked his own death uh, to escape his notoriety. And so what I, what I was prefacing there is I can't come up with the dates that uh, Billy the Kid was killed, but I, I, in my novel, I have that when I do research, I do exhaustive research, but then I often can't remember much of it after I actually utilize it in the book. Um, so the conceit of the novel is that he faked his own death to escape his notoriety and people coming after him. And he travels uh, to Canada with his brother Joseph to escape that notoriety. And, now, what um, you just are saying, Michael, is that historical, or is that is this what you're writing? No, that's 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 the the novel. That's the fiction part. Oh, so interesting. So I, I take the historical figure and then expand uh, to create um, a good almost forty years of his life after his uh, historical death. Wow! So I, I create a new life for him. So uh, have you completed it or are you, uh, is it in, in progress? No, that, that one's all done and it, uh, it releases in uh, April 22nd of this April year. April 22nd. Okay. Okay. Now you have a, an excerpt you're going to read for us from which, which novel? Is it from I Am Belated Kid or is it from Skin House? Which... I have a, a, an excerpt from Skin House and I also have one page from my uh, work in progress, which uh, I picked that because I'm just absolutely in love with my work in progress, which is always the case for me. And I hope it's the case for any writer. I'm just in a massive love affair with the novel. And so I, I wanted to cheat a page of that in too as well. But, but we can What's start the with title Skin House, one? It's called, it's a working uh, title, but I think it'll probably stick like my titles usually do. And it's called Miracle Train. Miracle Train. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to start with an excerpt from Skin House. And, and my understanding is it's got some coarse language. You're going to clean it up for the purposes of the broadcast, but uh, uh, people can kind of fill in the, the blanks here a little bit. Probably so. I mean, I, you could just uh, substitute uh, words of your choice for any words that I use, which will be uh, fairly clean. People should know okay. that uh, there's nothing clean about this novel, but the, uh, the excerpt has been, uh, has been uh, run through the washing machine. So after you read the excerpt, let's talk about Skin House a little bit, and then we'll get to that second ex excerpt. So go, go ahead, Michael. Sure. So uh, a little preface before, just so you know what's going on, because we're about 200 pages into a 300 page novel here. My two main characters are uh, reprobates. They're, uh, they're guys who, who spend most of their time in a bar to no good effect to anyone. And uh, they're not all that smart. And so they decide that uh, it would be a good idea to rob the grocery store where they're both employed, which is not a good idea at all. Either they don't get much money out of it and be, uh, it puts their lives in jeopardy. Uh, in the uh, process of that, they end up inadvertently or uh, inadvertently killing a moose, which, you know, is a hard thing to, to do when you're robbing a grocery store, but they manage to achieve it. And I shouldn't really say it's inadvertent because they use a handgun to do it. And they have an accomplice working with them, a fellow by the name of Johnny Sox, and he um, he ends up committing suicide shortly after the, uh, spoiler alert, committing suicide shortly after the uh, events by blowing himself up with dynamite, which is a whole other story. And, and he, uh, of course there are, this is a, I should point out a, while I'm doing this, this is a comedy. It's a dark comedy. And uh, he ends up in uh, quite a variety of pieces. And one of his fingers is really all they have left of him. And I'm, I'm having to point that out because that's how the section starts off. Two other things you need to know is that, uh, the main character's girlfriend is named Lisa, and she shows up at the end here. She's the only smart person in this entire book. And uh, their goal in this section is that they have to get rid of this finger because they think of it as evidence of the crime. And uh, so they're going to barbecue the finger. That's the best plan <laughs> that they could possibly come up with somehow. So here we go. 
So we go get Johnny's finger from my freezer, which, you know, is weird when you just say it like that, but that's what we do. And it's not like we're thinking of it like a barbecue. I mean, we don't bring any buns or barbecue sauce or anything, no condiments, no chopped onions, no coleslaw. I'm, I'm sitting there in the car with little Johnny in my lap. I've taken him out of the envelope and removed him from the condom wrapper that he's sitting there. He's sitting there in the fading sunlight. And Jerry says, are you sure that's him? What do you mean? Am I sure, Jerry? Well, I mean, it doesn't look like him. Well, who else would it be? Besides, it's not him. It's his finger. Which one? Which? How do I know which one, Jerry? What does it matter which one? It's the one that landed in the bush. I don't like it. I like that. Why do you have to take it out? Well, I thought maybe we should defrost it first. Defrost it? Yeah, you know, for the barbecue. Well, you're going to marinate it too? Well, I've never barbecued an appendage before, Jerry. I didn't know there were any rules. We sit there in silence for a while. Well, you got any propane? Yeah, I got enough. Jerry's place is in town, but almost out of town. You could throw a rock and hit woodlot. Mostly Jerry throws a rock and hits the side of his neighbor's garage when his neighbor's kid is in there practicing with the band. Jerry's not big on rock music. Or kids. Or small animals. Or people, really. Which explains all the live traps around his property. He's got a thing about raccoons and skunks on his property. He doesn't like them. He likes country music. And no kids. And no small animals. And no people. Really, Jerry just likes country music and vodka. Damn it! We arrive, and right away Jerry's out of the car quick and running back to the side of a little shed behind the house. I got one. I don't know what he's yelling about or what to do with Johnny's finger. Hurry up, Jerry's yelling now. So I throw the finger on Jerry's dashboard, and I run over. Jerry's grabbed a pitchfork, and he's advancing on a cage sitting on the snow near the shed. I gotta finish him. I gotta finish him off before he sprays. The skunk in the cage is eyeing us very warily and backing up into the corner. He's right to be suspicious of us. We are not trustworthy people. We have done bad things, and we will probably continue to do them. Nobody will stop us, and we are unlikely to stop ourselves. History has shown this. Jerry lunges in with the pitchfork. I can't stop thinking about Johnny's severed finger back on the dashboard of the car, how it looked really lonely sitting there like that. Jerry's trying like hell to get at the skunk, but the points of the pitchfork won't reach to where it is. The skunk's pissed now, and it's only going to be a matter of time. Get me something, Jerry yells at me. Damn it, the thing's going to squirt us. I open up the shed and grab the first thing I see, which is a chainsaw. What the hell, Jerry yells, still lunging. Yeah, I know, Jerry. There's nothing else to do now, though, so I start up the chainsaw. This really sets the skunk off now, and it starts to lunge back at the pitchfork which is probably a bad idea since it clips him and now he's hissing and he's back into his corner. The chainsaw is really loud and leaking smoke pretty bad, so I just shut it down. Jerry's into some kind of martial arts style attack now with his legs far apart and one foot really forward and one arm up, but the pitchfork is still not reaching the skunk. I run and get the garbage can and the garden hose from the side of the house. What? We'll drown him, Jerry. He'll be dead and the water will soak up the spray. Too late. He's right. The smell is everywhere, and at this range, it is strong. It sucks up all the oxygen in the yard. This is skunk ground zero. That bastard, Jerry's yelling, and he's stripping off his clothes now and running around in small circles in the snow like he's on fire. I am just calmly filling up the can with the water. I'm going to stink for days now, so there's no reason to get too excited or to hurry. Jerry runs past me towards the house a very angry, naked, bald, white man in the gathering dusk. This is the difference between me and a lot of people. I've seen hell, and this isn't it. So I just relax. It could be so much worse than this, and one day it will be again. This is my piece. I can hear Jerry slamming around in the house to turn on the water. He has the lights on now, and he yells to go ahead. When the water finally reaches the top of the can, I pick up the cage and I lower it in. Only the cage is a little bigger than I thought, or the can is smaller. Either way, the skunk is able to climb the wires and hold his head above the surface of the water, the poor bastard. He's clinging there, looking at me like Leonardo DiCaprio in Titanic. 
I reach into the can and try to push the cage further down, but it's wedged on the sides now and it won't move. The skunk takes swipes at my hands with its claws and I have to let go. Nothing is the way you think it's going to be, ever. Get out of the way! I turn around and Jerry's back, still naked, still angry, and still bald. This time, though, he has a handgun and he's pointing it at the skunk. Don't, I say, really slow and calm. But the skunk's going down. Move aside, Jerry. Too many people, I say, real quiet, my hands up. It's true. Even here, there are lots of people to hear a gunshot in the cold air and come over asking questions, and this is not a really good time for us to have to answer any questions. I can see this knowledge pass across Jerry's face, and he lowers the gun. We'll just start a fire, I tell him. We'll start a bonfire, and we'll put the cage on it. Then we can get the barbecue going, and we'll say goodbye to Johnny. It's like I'm explaining things to a child, like you do when something goes badly wrong. Look, we'll just pick the cake up and we'll put it back together. It'll be as good as new. Come on, you'll see. Wipe away those tears, champ. Wipe away those tears, champ. What? Jerry asks. Sorry, Jerry, that part wasn't supposed to be out loud. Come on, let's just get things going. We'll cook up some live stunk and a human finger, and it'll be great. It'll be just great. And for a minute, I believe it. Hey, guys. It's Lisa, which is not that great. Jerry's naked in the snow. We're about to do some live animal cooking, and there's a human appendage on the dashboard of the car right next to where she's standing right now. All the lights from the house are shining on it. Right there. Don't look. No, don't. Hey, Jerry's naked. Come and see this, I shout. What? She yells back. What? Jerry hisses. Well, it's all I could think of in a hurry. It's all right, Jerry. She's a nurse, I tell him. So? Well, so, Jerry, she's got low expectations. Don't worry. Look, she's standing right next to Johnny. We've got to get her moving. Jerry realizes I'm right. Hey, Lisa, come over here, he yells. I'm naked. Hey, look at this. After we explain that Jerry thought he was having an allergic reaction to skunk spray, so he took off his clothes, and after we get him wrapped up in a blanket and then into some new clothes, and she checks him out, I drag the cage to the back of the property for a humane live release of the skunk. We start the fire, and I drive out to get some marshmallows. And we sit there under the stars, and we toast them up. Everything seems pretty normal except for the finger wrapped in tinfoil at the center of the coals. Except for that. And the skunk smell. Lisa stares into the fire and leans her head on my shoulder. So I don't know. Life's funny, I guess. And that's that. <laughs> That is funny. That Thank is you. funny. Now, what is the rest of uh, Jerry? Is it Jerry's finger? Did you say uh, it's Johnny's finger? Yeah, Johnny's finger. Where's the rest of the body? Is is he is Johnny alive or is because they the, already dispose of it? The amount of uh, dynamite that uh, blew up in a situation that we can't really go into at the moment um, because just because we don't have time, uh, there was so much of it that. Uh, that's really all that's left. The rest, uh, it was an extensive cleanup, but there wasn't much left of a sizable amount. You know what that scene made me think of is the movie Fargo, where you've got, you know, a couple of bumbling criminals. Um, they're, they're incompetent. They're trying to figure out what to do. They're tripping over one another. Um, did you ever see that movie? Yes, and, and you're exactly right. Um, it, it had never occurred to me when I was writing it, but uh, our, one reviewer referred to the book as um, Bob and Doug McKenzie go to, go to Fargo. And I think that's probably pretty accurate. Bob and Doug McKenzie being the, the two characters by Dave Thomas and Rick Moranis in uh, Second City. Uh, so the, the, the archetypal uh, kind of uh, Canadian uh, Good fellas. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, dark comedy. Uh, well, Fargo certainly qualified as a dark comedy as well. And and the name Skinhouse came from where? Uh, that's interesting because uh, I can tell you where every title for every book that I've done or or am doing where where those titles came from. And Skinhouse came from the first two pages of the book, which. As is true with a lot of my books, uh, I started off writing a very different book than, than it ended up being. I started off writing something that was completely experimental, and the phrase skin house 
uh, came up in those first two pages and was intended to mean something entirely different from what uh, it does mean. And I have to, uh, sorry to say that for uh, a reader to know what the title means, you're going to have to get to the last page of the book because that's where it's revealed. Uh -huh. It's not, it's not like a big reveal or anything, but that's where it's explained. But uh -huh. there is a story that goes along with it. Uh, my mother, when she, she was still alive, uh, when I, when I, when the book was, uh, contracted to be published. And I said, I said to her, she would have been uh, 91, I think at that point, and just a, a lovely, lovely, prim, proper lady. And I said, mom, my, my next novel is going to be published. And she said, Oh, what's it called? What's it going to be called? And I said, well, this, this one's called skin house mom. And her face just changed. And, and she said, skin house. Why would anyone ever read a book called skin house? And, uh, she had her point, but uh, fortunately for me, uh, a lot of people did. You know, and that's a great segue to, to the next question I was going to ask you, which is how conscious are you when you're writing of whether an audience is going to is going to actually um, aggregate around the type of writing that you're doing? Do you think about the market, or you, do you just say this is what my inner voice is telling me, or my characters are telling me to say and do? And, um, you know, what, it, what the chips will fall where they may. My, my answer to the question, Mike, as to uh, how conscious I am of the market would be not nearly as conscious as my agent would like me to be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the true answer is virtually unconscious. It's not something that enters my mind at all. I think it's integral to my process that I don't think about that. I think about a, a hypothetical archetypal reader. I'm very aware that someone at some point is going to be reading this, but I don't think of a readership necessarily or, or a market. And uh, I, I'm sure that my, I, I think every book aside from uh, I've written the sequel to skin house and it's going to be uh, out within the next year or so. And uh, it's the only book that is similar to another book that I've written. And I know for a fact, my agent would prefer it to be otherwise because it's much easier to, sell to a publisher or to sell to a, to a readership when, when people know what they can expect when, you know, I read this book and I really liked it. So I'll get Mike's next book. Cause that'll be very similar. And fortunately or unfortunately, they're not uh, fortunately for me. I, I don't like to repeat myself. I, I always want to be doing something new. Yeah, I get it. You don't want to. Yeah. I don't understand how people really are genre writers. Cause it's, it really is the same thing over and over again, particularly when you end up getting locked down with a character. Uh, well, if, for instance, I mean, John D. McDonald, I guess, did it very well. He's mm -hmm. widely praised and, you know, he had Travis McGee. Um, but the stuff that he's written that I like is the stuff that's not the genre stuff, like a key to the suite, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's, it's just too constricting to, to um, uh, be a genre writer for me, for you, but, uh, Obviously, I, other people find find that to be a channel that they can really lock into and do well with. I couldn't do it myself just because I think I, my creative process, I, I would get I would get bored. I really enjoyed writing the sequel only because, I mean, you can get a, an idea, I guess, maybe from that excerpt. These guys, these two guys, are, are quite entertaining. Uh, and I say that not to pump up my own work. It's just that these, these are two strangers that I met and I, you know, created them and <laughs> gotten to know them and they really are entertaining fellows. And so I really enjoyed writing the sequel, uh, because of that fact alone. But I don't think that I would, uh, I don't think that I would want to repeat any of my other books. So the other excerpt you're going to read, you said is, is a, a page from your work in progress. And right. the title on that one again is? I actually got the title wrong. I, I think I said it was Miracle Train. It's actually called Mystery Train based on the, uh, on the song. Okay, that's a working title, but you say that it normally sticks. It normally so, does, yeah. Um, t uh, set this one up for us. What are we gonna, going to be hearing? I can't tell you the central conceit of the, of the novel uh, just because um, I have told a few people, my agent and, uh, and some friends, and whenever I tell the people what the, the basic concept of the novel is, they, they kind of go, wow, no one's ever done that. Mm -hmm. And when you run across an idea that no one's ever done, you tend to keep it pretty close to the chest because they're very uh, hard to find.
So I, I won't. You don't need to know anything about the central conceit of the novel to to understand this section. In fact, you don't really need to know much. It's almost a standalone. But there's a woman uh, by the name of uh, Viola, and she is uh, carrying twin children, and she's shopping in Memphis in uh, 1935, and that's probably all you really know for need to know for this section. It's it's only a page and a half long. Okay, fire away. So this chapter is called Dainty Little Moonbeams. And we're in Memphis on Saturday, April 6, 1935, and the time is 1.10 p.m. This unseasonable heat is absurd for April. It's the kind of heat that pushes you down from above and sticks you right to the pavement. People do not nod or smile or say hello or even look up when Viola passes, not because of the heat, but because she is showing. Not a great deal for seven months, it's true, but enough that merely doing some shopping is an act of civil disobedience. And in addition, many people, even here downtown, know that she is not married and that her fiancé has been run out of town by her father with the threat of police and lawyers and a 12-gauge shotgun. The heat is inspiring shadowy sweat stains on thin cotton clothing the full length of North Main Street, but even with life inside of her, Vi will have none of it, and she stays just as dry as the mannequins in Gerber's windows. She is wearing one of the few dresses she can these days, white, long, and embroidered with small pink rosebuds. The sales girls look up at her like cows lined against a fence and dreaming of nothing at all in July heat, and she refuses them eye contact and glances instead at her reflection in the full-length mirrors, her slight bulge, impossibly light for the twins Dr. Ayers claims she is carrying and will deliver soon enough. She pauses to gaze at the silver necklaces strung like Spanish moss in their glass cases, and she wonders why we love the things that will eventually break our hearts and then destroy us, whether those be people, money, alcohol, or just life itself. She tells herself once more that she thinks of death far too often for someone with two lives moving inside of her, but she is not happy in her spirit or quiet in her mind, and she can't help it. Drifting through the long, white, light rooms of Gerber's, she is reminded of heaven, or what heaven might be like, as she has never been there and does not imagine now for a moment that she will ever go. C.W. was all through the night throwing up and muttering in the washroom as if it were a confessional, his shifting shadow in the yellow light under the door back and forth, finally exiting and knocking through the house in the dark, rearranging chairs and couches with his shins and knees, and under his breath taking in vain the name of a god who no longer wishes him well. Since the accident, he has been mostly gin, and no matter how often he is told that it was not his fault, he will not listen because it was, and it is. He had driven Marguerite and Van out to Willow Lake in the Oldsmobile, even though the rain had threatened all that morning, and after the sun had appeared, he had drunk beer all the afternoon while the children swam, and then he had raced the train to the crossing on the way back, with the children thrilled and laughing until they realized that neither the train nor CW was going to stop. And he cannot now say why not, why he didn't just stop the car, just stop the car, are they here? He asks in hospital. Why aren't they here? And no one could tell him that he'd taken the top down and there had been nothing at all to hold them. Not that it mattered as the entire back of the car was gone and they with it. And that likely the only thing that had saved CW was the stubborn and resilient pliancy of a drunk. Father Arnaud was the only one to finally tell him, CW, they've gone home to which he had answered, can someone go and get them and bring them here so I can see them? But no one could. His grief now like a wellspring. Could I see this one? Vi asks the clerk who regards her briefly and then opens the case and passes her the bracelet, torn between the requisite deference to a wealthy family and the thrill of judgment. As Vi's water breaks, she is thinking, even as we live, we are dying. We are more shifting weather patterns than we are iron or stone, 
and she slides slowly down to the floor into slowly gathering darkness. From out of nowhere, someone's toy poodle lapping at the liquid. No, she thinks, no, no. Wishing that she could cast the moment into a herd of pigs and have them lurch over a cliff. Was that in Matthew or Luke, she wonders? And then she is gone. And that's Mystery Train. Wow, that is beautiful. That's a beautiful piece of writing, Michael. Thanks very much, Mike. Wow, and so different from the other excerpt you just read. I mean, uh, which is in keeping with, uh, you know, just your versatility as a writer and the, the, you know, the the variety of subject matter uh, you tackle. Now, did you write that in a single sitting? Was that something that the, you know, you had tapped the muse and, and it, and it really came out fully formed other than, other than, you know, up, you know, giving it a little spit shine. Yes. You've nailed that. That's exactly how it happened. And it took five or six hours. So five or six hours in front of the screen to craft that page and a half. But, uh, well, you know yourself, it's when, you, when, the, when the flow is there, five or six hours passes, like five or six minutes. And you look up and you look at the clock and think, oh, my God, what happened? Where was I? But that's where I was. It was a good day in the Blue and Household. <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> Popped a beer after that. You your step that evening, huh? <laughs> and, and Are I, you a morning writer? Or, well, you do five or six hours, so you're, that's a really a full day of work right there. I mean. These days, because I'm uh, I'm retired from uh, from the day job now, so it used to be five or six hours at night, uh, but now it's five or six hours. That starts probably around uh, after a workout and a walk, probably around ten or eleven in the morning. So you say you're obsessed with writing novels. Talk about that obsession. What? How? Again, I'd like you to kind of characterize that. What? What shape does it take? What emotions does it entail? How would you um, just define it? I would session. define it as the novel taking over your pretty much your entire life. Uh, it's always there. The work in progress is always in the back somewhere watching you or you're watching it. I'm not sure which way that works. Um, and I think of myself as a writer. I think of myself as a filter. So everything that happens in my life, and I, I'm, I'm sure it, there are moments when my wife wishes this were not the case, um, everything in my life gets filtered into the novel in some way or another. So no matter what I'm doing, I'm also writing a novel. And uh, it's not like I'm, you know, sitting in a corner at a party or something, uh, scribbling on, on pieces of paper and ignoring everybody, but there's my conscious mind uh, engaged in what's happening at any given moment. And there's the subconscious mind furiously working away on the work in progress. And, and very often parts of the conscious mind uh, get involved in that as well. So, you know, a, a line of dialogue that somebody says in a room or the way something looks on a shelf or anything really a piece of music anything uh is potentially going to be incorporated in the novel and and my role in that is just kind of uh saying yes no yes no you're in you're not sorry you didn't make the cut <laughs> mm. <clears throat> so um you know the photograph i have of you uh that i'm going to use with the youtube version of uh of this podcast um you have a sh short sleeves on, you have a t-shirt on, and at least one of your arms has got, is basically dedicated to tattoos. Mm -hmm. Does, does that arm or do the tattoos on other parts of your body as well tell a story? Uh, sure, they do. Yes, consciously so. Uh, it, it's really, in a way, I guess it's an extension of my writing practice. Um, it's both arms, both arms full. Uh, one, my left arm, uh, the biggest tattoo there is the actual cover design, the original cover design for Skin House that I did before my uh, publisher pointed out that they uh, have, you know, uh, professional designers who can do things like that. And I didn't really need to stick my nose to, they put it much nicer than that. But uh, anyway, it's the original cover design. Uh, and then I have a line also on that arm from, uh, one of my favorite writers, an inspiration to me, uh, a Canadian poet by the name of Bill Bissett. And the line is, now I mostly live in the words and images. And Say so that again. Now I mostly live in the words and pages? And images. 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 The words okay. and images. Because he's a painter as well. Um, so that rings true to me as a, as a writer. And uh, then the other tattoos, uh, I have the word amore on my the fingers of my right hand, which is uh, from the Dean Martin song, That's Amore, because that was uh, the wedding song that my wife and I danced to. 
and uh, a couple of other quotes and a sailing ship that represents my family and uh, things like that. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> talk about Chase and Haven, your first published novel. You say that that novel succeeded after <laughs> two failed attempts. Why did it fail the first two times? What what happened that you declared it a failure and started again, or had to restart? It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't actually Chase and Haven that that I started again. It was two complete novels that I had written that were different from Chase and Haven uh, prior to writing Chase and Haven, and they failed. Um, I think because I didn't know, uh, I didn't know well enough what I was doing. I was learning the craft, and when I say they failed, that they failed artistically. They never even uh, made it to to a publisher to be rejected. I realized that uh, that they weren't complete enough to to be successful. Um, and why they weren't successful, I think, has a lot to do with uh, voice. I hadn't. Uh, honed my voice sufficiently. And somehow when I started writing Chase and Haven, which would have been around 2005, probably, um, suddenly the voice was there. And uh, I don't, I think, you know, I was going to say, I don't know where it came from, but I guess it came from those first two attempts and a lot of other uh, attempts as well. It came from practice. And I was fortunate yeah, enough. about Oh, go ahead. You're fortunate enough. To uh, just fortunate enough to uh, to have it arrive. Yeah, it was uh, in in my case it was the same thing with the first two, where just I wrote myself into a corner and I realized I that I never got that end page that you were talking about earlier, kind of that destination. And then I realized I had written a lot of words, and it's just like this is for me to get to any kind of ending is going to. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking seven, eight hundred, nine hundred pages, and that was absurd for a first effort. So, yeah, just abandon it. You know, you talk about a flow state. A uh, lot, lot of creative people talk about the flow state. Uh, but you also say that you tend to work on more than one project at a time. Isn't it difficult to uh, to actually immerse yourself in a flow state if you have multiple, if you're not just riveted to one uh, uh, effort or one project? This is the first time, uh, Miracle Train is the first time that I've actually only had one project on the go, as opposed it's to... Mystery Train. It's Mystery, mystery Train. train. <laughs> yeah. Did I, I got it right that time. Yeah, I think <laughs> eventually I'll, I'll get that down. Um, it's the only time that I've ever had just one, uh, one project on the go, and I'm kind of enjoying it. But previously, I, I found, well, one aspect of that is just in terms of practicality, um, Billy the Kid, I think, took about seven years to write. And uh, I don't feel that I have enough time left on the planet to, to take seven years between publishing books. And uh, my agent lets me know that it's not seven years, eight years, nine years, 10 years is not necessarily a good span of time to let elapse between publications in terms of uh, being considered current or, or being uh, acknowledged, you know, being a name that comes across a publisher's desk and, and, oh, yeah, I know who that is. He had that book last year or the year before, as opposed to, oh, I remember that guy with that book 12 years ago. That's not the best, uh, best foot forward kind of thing in terms of the business. Um, so that's one reason why I've always uh, previously had more than one project on the go. But I find in terms of flow state, I don't find that a problem. It, the, the, it's almost a cliche, you know, in the way that I keep saying the characters tell me what to do, but the books tell me what to do as well. So if I sit down in the office to, to start working, I'll know which, which book is uh, calling me to write that day because it's the one that's been working in the subconscious and is, is knocking on the door and saying, hey, we got, boss, we got some ideas for you. What do you think of these? You know, you had mentioned uh, just just – just now you had said, um, I don't think I have um, enough time on the planet to, you know, dot, 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 um, which, you know, when I hear something like that, it implies that you believe in, in something transcendent, uh, that there's a metaphysical realm. Uh, is that the case? And uh, does does the spiritual or metaphysical, do you, do you feel that you tap that at all in your writing? Do you believe that there's something um, transcendent that uh, we are able to? to tap into and it becomes the, the fountain of the most creative work that a, that a person can do. I think so. I, I mean, I shared with you previously, I think I, I've, uh, 
lived a life that uh, has had several incidents in it uh, somewhere between eight and ten times now that I've almost died or almost been actively killed. And uh, that in part has led me to to where I am maybe as a person and as a writer. Um, you ask whether there's something transcendent. I absolutely firmly know that there is something transcendent. And I've also reached a point in my life where I know that I have absolutely no idea what that is. And I have no chance of ever finding out in this realm. So I, I, yeah. I, I guess that, I guess that answers the question. Uh, yeah, it does. No. And, and it's a, it's a, the kind of, uh, it's a believable answer. So often people are so definitive about that. They, they know it's there and they, they even know what it is, which to me is preposterous because it's got to be something that's unfathomable mm-hmm. and, and, and beyond the language because we only have fashioned our language around the things that we know and the things that we experience. Um, so why so many near death experiences? If you don't mind my asking, you sound like a guy who worked for the, uh, you know, alcohol, tobacco and firearms and <laughs> we're doing a lot of investigative work. Um, why did you have so many near-death experiences? Uh, partly, I would I would chalk it up to stupidity, and and part I would uh, chalk up to just chance. Uh, I've I've run a, a flipped a jeep off of a highway at 110 kilometers an hour, and and gone 30 yards over a ditch, and ended up upside down in a in an accident that I really shouldn't have survived. Um, and you know, when you watch things like that in movies, and everything slows down, that's exactly what it's like. Mm. Um, I've been taken down by a SWAT team, by a tactical team, uh, not because of anything, because I was, uh, that was a case of, uh, uh, misidentification. It wasn't me that they were looking for. And that's a long story in itself, but, um, uh, I've fallen an exciting life, (laughs) adventuresome life in, I don't and think of it that way. Different. You know, I just think of it as the life that I've led. But when I tell people these stories, they're kind of like, oh, what? That, my life wasn't like, isn't like that. So I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe I've retired from that now because there have been so many of those incidents. And uh, I wouldn't mind uh, taking a break. But, but then, you know, a year and a half ago, our house got fire and I was in it repeatedly after it was burning. So maybe I'm not quite done yet. Wow. Well, if you've got nine lives, you've got one left, so be careful. Yeah, well, Um, because I've got more books to write. Exactly, exactly. So you have, um, you know, people's lives change when they have a child or or they're giving birth to a novel. Uh, That's like a child. So, and you've got several children on the way. So good to hear that. You know, you started off, uh, we could wrap it up with this, Michael. I did want to ask you about the fact that you worked in the film industry um, you, you got a degree in film production, you worked in the film industry. What did you do in film? And did, did the film, you know, the, a lot of people who write books dream of making the silver screen. They want their books to become movies and, and they, they sometimes will even write in a cinematic fashion because they want a director to read it in that way and think, mm-hmm. wow, this could be a mo- movie. Um, so talk about the relation, what, what you did in the film industry and any relationship with your, with your writing of, of books. There's a relationship for sure. Well, first, the easy answer to what I did in the film industry is nothing significant. <laughs> um, I finished my film degree. By the time I finished that four-year degree, I'd already realized that, hey, I don't want to make films. I want to write books. First of all, in practical terms, to make a film, you need, well, let's put it in today's terms, you need you know, $50 million as a start, and you need 300 to 400 to 500 other people uh, and you need someone who owns you because they're supplying the money. Uh, and when you're writing a novel, you need a pad of paper and a pencil. And that's mm-hmm. it. So, mm-hmm. uh, and I also realized that my talents lay in, in writing uh, as opposed to uh, making a uh, film. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, I, I, I think... In terms of would I like to see any of my books turned into movies, I guess, sure, I would, but I already think of them as movies, so it would almost be redundant. Um, yeah, I, you know, they, they play in my head like movies. and uh, so, so you see imagery. I mean, you see the imagery as you're writing. You, you try to put yourself, for instance, in the setting, and, and you watch the characters 
uh, take action. Yeah, and I think of it as acting too, Mike. Um, I'm I'm very much in the moment when I'm writing any scene, and and I think I, I taught acting for uh, a number of years at the high school level, and uh, the way that I taught acting is very similar to the way that I think of myself as a writer. I'm uh, I'm the maybe I'm the extra because I'm in the background of every scene, and, and you're not necessarily going to see me, but I'm. I'm living the moment that I'm writing, which I think is probably true of any novelist, but I, I feel that very intensely. Interesting. So um, last question, actually, that wasn't the last one. I want to ask you one more question here, Michael, and that is just the, um, um, what would you want people to know about Michael Blue and the novelist? Uh, what hasn't been said? What haven't you had a chance to say that you would, uh, just to put an exclamation point on, um, what we've talked about, um, who is Michael Bloom, the novelist, from a, a, a reader's perspective? Um, it's probably a disappointing answer, but I probably wouldn't say anything at all. I don't, I don't, I don't think people uh, should know necessarily anything about Michael Bloom, the novelist. And, and I think probably the more that they know, probably the less magical the novels are, because then you you come into this situation where you're trying to figure out how does this relate to the person who wrote it. Um, and I'd much prefer to think of themselves, think of, of the books as standalone items that uh, just appeared out of nowhere. As, as you uh, progress in a career as a novelist, uh, you know, it's not like being a, a, an actor or, or a celebrity in any way, but, but you do uh, take on this somewhat public persona through readings and appearances and interviews and that type of thing. And um, I enjoy doing all of that, but at the same time, I'm very conscious that that's one thing and writing is another thing and, and writing is significantly more important. And, and there's information because you do so many interviews and things like that. There's so much information now, especially with the internet that's out there. You know, if, if you, Google me, you find a lot of information and not all of it is accurate. Uh, even my, my Wikipedia entry and I, I, you know, I don't, I never had any hand in uh, creating it, but, uh, whoever has, I'm, I'm grateful to them that they've done it because it's there now, but it's, it's not entirely accurate, even though it's not very long. So there's, I, I do find that part of it quite entertaining that there will be information out there about me that is not true. And, uh, I relate that to, uh, you know, creating fiction. So I, I don't mind thinking of myself as a fictional character, but, but I, <laughs> but I hate thinking of myself as a, some type of public figure. Right. That's interesting. And, you know, you connected it back. I was going to connect it back to film and you mentioned actor. And, um, you know, when you think about, uh, a lot of these Hollywood types, there are certain ones like De Niro is an example, Robert De Niro, you never see him on the sunset strip getting shot by the paparazzi. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like doing interviews. He kind of is forced into it when a new movie comes out, but he doesn't like doing interviews. It's hard to sell yourself on the screen if people know you too well as, as that person who you really are rather than the character that you're going to play. And I've found that I'm always much more nervous about somebody who knows me reading what I've written because they already know who I am. And, mm -hmm. and then I look like I'm trying to sell something that I'm not. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, I really think I'm asking for your opinion on this, Michael. It's, it's kind of like the best reader is that virginal reader. The one who doesn't know you never met you, um, never heard from you. And what you have on the page is pure. Here's another quote that I always forget where it came from. Uh, even though I, that I, I, I use it as a watchword and I, share it with as many people as I can, but it's that, that question of who do you write for? And uh, I'm stealing from someone. I, I just don't remember who it is that I write for that 16 year old boy or girl, uh, maybe in a, in a farmhouse in Iowa in 50 years from now, who runs across a dusty copy of skin house or I am Billy the kid and it changes them somehow. That's my ideal writer. Uh, sorry, my ideal reader. And um, being a uh, uh, public figure in no way helps that. So mm -hmm. it, it's about it, being a public figure can can be. I've I've had a little of it enough to know that it can be a very very dangerous thing to the creative process. 
which is one reason why I love this particular podcast, Mike, is because it's about it's about creating art and it's about the business of not just, uh, you know, publishing, but of, of producing books in, in a wide variety of ways. And that's the type of thing that I love to participate in as opposed to, you know, something that might create myself as something separate from just the books. Mm -hmm. Cause it's the books Our that are important. Our guest has been Michael Bluen, decorated Canadian novelist. Uh, Michael, uh, keep us post, keep me posted on uh, Mystery Train. That was a gorgeous piece of writing that you read for us, and I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on a copy of that. So um, when that's ready to publish, drop me a note. Maybe we can double back and, and do a, a quick interview on that one as well. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks so much, Mike. It's really been a pleasure. Great, great questions.